Mary Beth Tining is an American serial killer, mother and wife on the outside, and killing most of her own children on the inside. Mary Beth Rowe was born on September 11, 1942, in a small town in New York called Doonesburg. Her father was an electrician and a World War II soldier. When he was home, he would frequently abuse her and sometimes lock her in the closet. He made her think everything he did to her was well-deserved and not out of malicious intent. Her mother also worked a lot, so she often went back and forth with other relatives. It was known and very outspoken that Mary Beth was an accident, an unwanted child. Her younger brother, on the other hand, was beloved and favored by everyone. She worked a few low-wage jobs throughout high school and became a nurse's aide upon graduating. Mary Beth met Joseph Tining on a blind date set up by some of their friends. Joseph was a quiet but happy man. They got married in 1965. In 1974, Joseph went to the hospital with a near-fatal dosage of barbiturate poisoning. After returning home, their marriage started to decline for a while. Mary Beth started putting pills in Joseph's grape juice while she got from a friend with an epileptic daughter. Joseph didn't press any charges against his wife. Mary Beth's father suffered from a heart attack while she was pregnant with her third daughter. Dad, before you die, I just really wanted to say that I love you. I didn't ever want you, and I don't love you. After her father died, the family was filled with deaths. On December 26, 1971, Jennifer, the Tining's third child, was born with hemorrhagic meningitis and multiple brain abscesses and died after only a few weeks. Two weeks later, Joseph Jr., their second-born child, was taken to the ER, claiming he had seizures and choked on his vomit. After they found nothing wrong with Joseph at the hospital, they sent him home. But hours later, he was brought back and dead from cardiopulmonary arrest. Weeks after that, Barbara, their oldest child, was rushed to the hospital and had gone into convulsions. She died the following day after being in a coma for only a few hours. Timothy was born on Thanksgiving in 1973, but on December 10th, he was brought back to the hospital after being found dead in his crib. Nathan was their fifth child born in the spring and then died the next fall in the car while running errands with Mary Beth. On October 29, 1978, Mary Frances was the sixth child born, but that following January, she was rushed to the ER after having seizures. They revived her, but a few months later, she returned to the hospital in full cardiac arrest, and after being revived again, she had irreversible brain damage and died two days later by being taken off of life support. The Tinings adopted a newborn baby, Michael, who fell down the stairs at age two and got a concussion. After he wouldn't wake up, they brought him into the hospital, but he was dead by the time they arrived. This ended the theory that all the children's deaths were somehow related through a genetic origin. Their final child was Tammy Lynn, born on August 22, 1985. At four months old, she was smothered to death. That day, members from social services and the police department showed up to the Tynings' house to investigate Tammy Lynn's death. When Mary Beth and Joseph were taken into questioning, Mary Beth confessed to the murders of Tammy Lynn, Nathan, and Timothy. She was charged for the murder of Tammy Lynn and considered suspicious for all her other children's death, with the exception of Jennifer, who died before ever leaving the hospital. Mary Beth was never diagnosed, but was believed to suffer from fictitious disorder imposed on another. This is a mental disorder where the caretaker harms the person in care in order to receive attention and sympathy. I said, don't get it, don't arrest her without a confession. You know, do everything right just because you think she did it. 
Schenectady County Assistant DA Alan Gabell was one of those who thought that Mary Beth Tinning did it. After all, without any explanation over a 14-year period, every one of her nine children had died suddenly and without warning. The family's deadly secret began to unravel in 1985 when Tinning called a friend in a panic to say that baby Tammy Lynn was lying still on the changing table. Police had more than once questioned how so many children could die mysteriously, but they had nothing to go on. The medical community attributed death to other causes other than homicide, and there were autopsies. Gabell says pediatricians passed her around from doctor to doctor because no one wanted to have anything to do with her. It was when she refused the offer of a SIDS monitor with the final child, Tammy Lynn, that her new doctor became suspicious. Police eventually came back again to the house on Michigan Avenue, and this time they took the 42-year-old woman in for questioning. That's when the lucky break happened. Bill Barnes was the state police investigator who knew Tinning as a child. She gave him a hug and a kiss when he came to question her. What did you say to her to get her to confess? This can't be natural, and there's got to be a reason for it, and that uh, she admitted that she had killed uh, the children. Was as not, simple it was, as that? It was easy, really. It was simple. She had a need to tell, to confess? I think so. Bill Barnes, by all accounts, was being modest. He had a confession in four minutes. I believed that she did it. I really did. I thought she, she was responsible. And uh, I think she felt that. You know, she never resisted that. Tinning's attorney, Paul Callahan, told me she insisted the confession the was forced. Based upon what my client told me and what she testified to in the hearing that we had before the trial, the yes, it was coerced. Famed forensic pathologist Dr. Michael Bodden was called into the Tinning case by Schenectady uh, Police Chief Dick Nelson. Nice. Bodden says his review of the eight deaths showed clearly that this had to be murder. It's not possible to have nine sudden infant death uh, cases, just mathematically, statistically not possible. There's still always going to be, I think, this lingering question in people's minds, how could this happen? Certainly Joe Tinning has to take some blame for that. Some other husband might have been more active. Through it all, Joe Tinning stayed by his wife's side, even after the courtroom exploded with the allegation that Mary Beth Tinning had tried to poison him. The story was that she was having an affair with somebody, with somebody in the community and she therefore tried to kill her husband by putting, uh, I think it was barbiturates, in his soup. But he refused to believe that she would have done him any harm. I had an overdose. Whether she gave it to me, I'm not sure. I said, your family is gone, your kids are dead, and your wife admitted she just tried to kill you. I said, how do you feel? He thought for a minute. He said, gee, it's God's will. If it's God's will, that's what it should be. Ultimately, it came down to this. A jury in this courtroom accepted the confession and rejected the defense argument that the children had died of a genetic disease, something that Paul Callahan still questions to this day. Her mother-in-law, Edna Tinning, testified that any of these kids, when you picked them up, it was like a, a sack of water. It was these kids didn't have muscle tone. She went off to prison proclaiming her innocence. Now she's done 20 years, but the parole board says she'll stay in prison for at least two more. DA Bob Carney, for one, thinks that's just. How can we trust that she will abide the law uh, and not commit new crimes when she hasn't even accepted any responsibility for the crime she was convicted of? At Mary Beth's trial, Tammy Lynn's pediatrician testified that the Tynings dismissed the suggestion to install a breathing monitor in Tammy, considering the other children's history. Two other medical examiners testified that the autopsy proved Tammy Lynn's death was from being smothered with a soft object. Throughout the trial, Joseph spoke out on Mary Beth's behalf, believing she was innocent to the end. Mary Beth Tining was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Mary Beth continuously attempted to be released on parole, but kept getting denied because of lack of remorse and understanding of all she had done. Finally, on her seventh attempt, Mary Beth was released on parole August 21, 2018, after serving 31 years in prison. Her husband, Joseph, was at her release. She will remain under parole supervision for the rest of her life. She also has a curfew and must go to violence counseling.
This was an innocent, vulnerable victim who was entrusted in your care as her mother, and you viciously violated that trust, causing a senseless loss of this young life. They went on to say discretionary release would so deprecate the severity of the crime as to undermine respect for the law as you placed your own interest above those of society's youth.